online. We are so glad to worship alongside you this morning as well. My name is Jack Bodenhammer. I am the interim teaching pastor here uh, and so glad to worship on this second Sunday of Advent. And so wonderful time of the year, one of my absolute favorites. Uh, our Advent series this year is about hope, and we're, we're just talking about the very avenues of, of hope that we see realized and maybe unrealized in our lives and in our faith. Hope, for me, is one of the most powerful words in any language. Hope propels us forward. Think about it, hope and things like sports, right? Hope of, of just the next chance to score the ball, right? Uh, UMHB had some hope yesterday, even down 10 to come back and win, amen, right? But hope propels us forward in things like class or business that we might make this month better. Hope propels us forward in relationships, that as long as there's hope, we can move forward. It's the same way with faith. And in fact, our faith is one of hope, of things unseen, of faith and the things that we hope for. And so we turn to, to Romans 8 this morning as, as the source of our hope to be found in the love of God. Josh read this for us last week and kind of uh, all of its complexity, and, and we're just going to read a portion to get started this week to, to remind us of this hope that we have is born out of a God that loves us. We're going to read chapter 8, starting in verse 37. You can turn there, you can flip to it in your phone, whatever it may be, copy off your neighbor, look on theirs. Paul writes this to the church of Rome, starting in verse 37. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Just a pause there, just as a word of encouragement. I love this phrase, you are more than conquerors. I think a lot of the times we walk around defeated. We are more than conquerors. That's free. For this I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Neither height nor depth, angels, demons, things in our present, things in our future. Paul lays out this idea that our external circumstances, even things we can't see, like angels and demons, nothing, can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. Heights or depths. And, and why does Paul include heights and, and angels? I think about it in this way. There are often times in our lives where we're working at the mountaintop or we're, we're having a pretty good go of it. We're at that height. And wouldn't you know that sometimes those are the moments where God takes a back seat and we forget how we got to that point in the first place. So even in that moment where things are great and we're just scooting down the road, we're not separated from the love of God. That is a hopeful thought. There's a, there's a song that we sing primarily across the hall. Maybe we've sung it in here. Uh, you, you may have known it if you, you listen to Christian radio or, or been across the hall. It's, a, uh, it's called Reckless Love. And I like this song. It's a great song. It's about the work of love of God. And the chorus goes like this. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. It chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Now, Gary, Joe asked me if I was going to sing that, and it was at this very moment where I looked at everybody and went, no, no. I like this song, though, because the, there, there's so many good lyrics about what God is doing and God's love for us. But if I were the writer... I would change one word. 
I'd just make one small edit. My song would go something like, oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, wreckful love of God. Except that's not a word. <laughs> Did you know that, that the opposite of reckless is not wreckful? So maybe I would change it to the overwhelming, never-ending, intentional, deliberate, mindful, careful work of the cross. And I'll never make it in Nashville that way. (laughs) But that's that's the love of God, guys. That, That is intentional. It's deliberate. It's mindful. It's it's personal. It's meaningful. And we read about this kind of love just a few chapters prior. Turn back with me to to Romans 5. I want to read a couple verses from there. About this love and the hope that we get from it. Starting in verse 6 of chapter 5, Paul writes, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only this is so, but we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. A portion of scripture here about the love of God. Now, if you're a note taker, I want you to do something this morning. I want you to take a line, draw it down the middle of your paper. And if you're not a note taker, that's fine. Uh, Maybe today's the day to start. Or maybe just draw a line down the middle of your brain. Um, We're going to have two categories here uh, for us to think about. The first category is how the scripture talks about humanity. About me and you. In this second category, we're going to look at what the scripture says about how it talks about God. Okay? So, so stick with me on this. That, that this humanity corner, uh, let's, let's work this side of the puzzle first. Paul writes that we are powerless. The beginning of this verse 6. Powerless. Sickly. Weak. Unable to make any kind of change and justification for ourselves. We cannot make ourselves righteous. We cannot put ourselves into right relationship with God, is what Paul is saying. You don't have the power to do that. You are powerless. Not not even just a little bit, but powerless without the ability to make the change. So we're powerless. We're also ungodly, which is not a word we use a ton in our common language. And and Paul does this really unique thing here where he says, uh, describing the ungodly, and then he, he juxtaposes it with the righteous and the good. All right? So we're put in this ungodly category. Then he talks about the righteous, that uh, very rarely does someone die for a righteous person, but for a good person, someone might. Well, what's the difference? Why, why the righteous good? Well, there's a lot going on here. It's important for us to understand in the first century, this is an honor and shame culture. And we don't catch that much in the West. We don't understand that. But in an honor and shame culture, if you are shameful, you're put out. You're ostracized. You're put to the side. That if you lose your honor, the community might disown you and you're left for survival alone in this world. 
Now, this is true for both Greeks and Jews, okay? First century world, if you are on the wrong side of honor and shame, you're left in the cold. Now, a righteous person is someone who's morally and ethically right. That do the right things, uh, the moral imperatives, if you will. A good person is someone who is impacting the culture around them. Okay? So in this idea of honor and shame, there's also reciprocity, right? That if I do good, then others around me will do good to me. And that was the expectation of being honorable. And we see it throughout the New Testament constantly that good people that have works in this world, it's expected that good to come around to them. For example, uh, when the centurion's daughter is, is ill, the Jews uh, advocate for the centurion because he's built a synagogue and he cares and he loves God. Um, and they say, hey, this, this person has done good to the community. We should do good for him and ask Jesus to heal. That's what's going on here. Say, for the righteous person, you're not gonna really do that. That's a morally right person. Someone will die for a good person because that's the expectations of society. But the ungodly stay over there. We're over there. Powerless. Ungodly. We're gonna come back to that. Because Paul also describes us as sinners. I don't like that word. Do you like that word? How would y'all like to be welcomed every Sunday morning as, hello, sinners. We're so glad you joined us for worship this morning. Welcome to our sinners online. We're so glad you're watching us from home. No, we don't like that term because it reminds us we have, we have done things to alienate ourselves from God. We have done things that God has told us not to do and we know that. We have left things undone that we know we should have done. And we call all of that sin. And to be reminded of that, it's uncomfortable. It brings on feelings like guilt and shame. sinners so we're powerless ungodly sinners and enemies of God kind of wish we just had stayed with sinners because enemy denotes something even worse See, first century, take us back, right? Enemies, what do enemies do? They steal, they kill, they destroy. It sounds like the enemy, doesn't it? But it's true that if you had an enemy, it's because they're coming to take your property, take your land, destroy your faith system, give you a different language, make you have a different name. Enemies were real and you hated them. And it was almost virtuous to hate your enemies. And here we are being called enemies of God. That is an uncomfortable place to be. That's our category. Now let's look at what God is doing here. God, in this second category of our page, died for the ungodly. You remember the ungodly? We're, we're over here, right? And that maybe someone would die for somebody good, but certainly not for the ungodly. They're ostracized, and God says, watch this, I'll die for the ungodly. That culture has this dictate that those people are unworthy, and, and this one commentator said uh, that the that divine Behavior runs counter to cultural expectations. Praise God. The whole world says, get out, and God says, come here. 
So God dies for the un, un, ungodly. God demonstrates love. This is an ongoing demonstration. This is a present tense verb. God demonstrates love. Yes, Jesus died once on the cross and for all. He resurrected on that third day. But it is an ongoing demonstration that here in this room, we can look to the cross today to see the love of God. It's as important for us at First Baptist Temple in the 21st century as it was for Rome in the first century. If you're sitting in your chair and you need to know that God loves you, let me point you to the cross as the demonstration of God's love for you. And keep going back there. It keeps demonstrating for us. So God died for the ungodly. God demonstrates his love. Christ died for us. 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 It is a tiny word with such great significance. And that us is sometimes so much bigger than we're comfortable with. But this is a God that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for the ungodly. Demonstrated love, demonstrates love. Dies for us. And justifies us through his blood. Now, justified is this legal term. And we are justified, we are made right, we are put into right relationship through the blood of Jesus Christ. This is not something that we can do. Notice it doesn't say, you justified yourselves. No, we are the objects here. God takes us and justifies us. He makes us right. Because we're powerless. And so our legal stance with God is made whole. Despite our sin, despite our ungodliness, despite being enemies, Christ justifies us through his blood. But God doesn't stop there. We are reconciled to God through the death of Jesus. It could have been God's prerogative to say, look, I'm going to justify you, but I'm a holy and perfect God, and even though you're justified and you're legally okay, stay over there. I'm holy. Don't enter my holy of holies. You're not worth it. But God didn't do that. God reconciled us and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And the image for this is a stark one. Now I want you to think about this. That, that throughout the Bible, the, the image and analogy of adulterer and adultery is used for the people of God who go astray. That in the relationship of God, uh, the analogy breaks uh, that we lose faith. We become adulterous in our relationship with God. And that's a powerful word. I realize that's a charged word. I realize there are people in this, this room today that have been touched by adultery. They know uh, what it means to hurt in that way. And I don't use it lightly because I don't think the Bible uses it lightly. I think the Bible takes something that we understand that is devastating, that breaks trust, breaks faith, that is harmful, we understand the depths of struggle and strife that comes with something like adultery. And God says, we're reconciled now. Friends, we need to understand we were on the wrong side of a bad relationship through our own actions and sin and alienation from God. 
And God didn't just justify us to make us right. God said, come here and be reconciled. And I find that deeply encouraging. Because I think largely in this room we fall into two basic categories as humanity, as those that fall into this. We might get to this point in our faith journey and feel pretty good about ourselves. That we're good people. That we're doing good things for God. We come to church a couple times a month. We even give. We do things. We're, we're not mean to our coworkers. And somewhere along the way, we think that we're earning God's love. And friends, there are whole faith systems of the world that are built on this, of just be a little bit more good than you are bad, and you'll be okay. This is false. You can't earn God's love. God loves you. God pours out uh, love on a cross. But the other kind of group in this room that maybe we feel into are are those of us that know precisely who we are. We know we're sinners. And we know our thoughts and our deeds and what's in our past. And just the flip side of the coin that thinks that they can earn God's love is the person that thinks that God could never love them. This also is false. There's nothing, nothing you've done to make yourself unredeemable because it's not up to you. God chose this. God sent his only son because God loves us. Christ died for us. So wherever you are on that kind of scale, whether you you kind of fall into that trap of feeling, you know what, I'm doing pretty good. God must really love me. You see me, God, I'm serving. God, you see that? Put that into my account. Hear me say, you should do good things and be good people, all right? Um, don't, don't walk out of here and go, as Jack said, we don't have to be nice. <laughs> you do. But don't mistake a holy life lived because you serve a holy God for earning God's grace and love. You can't do it. But nor should you leave this place and think that God doesn't love me. God can't love me. Because God does. that it is God who loves, Christ that justifies, Christ that reconciles, Christ that saves. And the call is out to us. It's Jesus in his first sermon as recorded by Mark. Repent and believe There's power and love in the cross, and there's something to hope for. See, in this time of Advent, I think about how, how Jesus' first appearance there in Bethlehem and, and the, the angels that come down and, and bring great tidings of comfort and joy. And that is the hope that we hold on to in this moment. Hope. That you can't earn God's love. Hope that you can't earn God's love. Not through any good you do, not through any bad you do. God loves you. God loves us. And that, my friends, in this time of Advent, something worth hoping in. And if you're sitting there this morning, 
And you need that hope, that reconciliation, that justification, that salvation. Maybe it's the first time. Maybe you sit there and go, look, I've never experienced that kind of reconciliation to God. Maybe you're sitting there and it's been a long life of filled with faith, but you find yourself falling into those traps. May your hope be in this God that loves you, not because you're great, but because God is great. God, we are grateful because you call us into relationship with you. You restore us. You justify us. You save us. God, you reconcile us. And it is but the call to faith that you offer us. In this room and around the world, God, we join the choruses of worshipers. Grateful that we can love you because you have first loved us. And God, may we not leave this place with any shadow of a doubt that there's nothing we could do to earn your love, God, but there's nothing that we can do that takes your love away from us, that separates us from your love. God, and if we need that, may we be so bold to ask for it this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.